having all main important messages being said and framed, as you mentioned, I just would like to thank you, the teams and the co-organizers. It was a real pleasure to uh, work on this, uh, pre the preparation of this session, and I believe, and I hope we go beyond that. Um, so I will go straight to the first panel that um, integrates a representative of a national government in Latin America to local governments from a Africa and Asia and a grassroots and NGO organizations. Um, I will start uh, calling the Vice Minister Patricio Moreira from Costa Rica and I just would like to put a context. I learned yesterday that um, the Central American national government signed a declaration for reconstruction in response to COVID. And in this declaration, uh, informal settlements is being perceived as key for further development of the region. And not only that, of course, it's obvious and it's there that uh, informal settlements are key and fundamental for the whole uh, well being of the society. But the declaration clearly, clearly recognizes that if upgrading informal settlements infrastructure, low-income housing is the key aspect that will change the economies in the region, that will guarantee that economies in the region will recover after the COVID. So this is a very important context. Um, and Costa Rica um, was a pioneer in launching a national protocol pretty much connected with the new urban agenda, with the principles of multi-level governance and the participation of the new urban agenda. So therefore, Patricio, come here to you. I believe you move to Spanish. Hi, how are you, Ana Claudia? How are you, everybody? Nice to see you. I thought this was, in, um, I prepared my presentation in, in Spanish, uh, so I'm kind of shamed. I didn't see that this space was in English, but I will translate myself to Spanish and uh, I should have, I should share the, okay, here it is. We have interpreters, Patricio, so don't worry. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Bueno, muchas gracias a todas las personas que nos acompañan. Muy contento desde Costa Rica. Debo decir que, que estoy muy contento de participar en este espacio porque toda mi vida he trabajado en asentamientos informales y en gobiernos locales. Así que me siento como en, una, en, en mi casa, pero en una red internacional. Eh, muy rápidamente, este, como bien puedes saber, pues Costa Rica se ubica en Centroamérica. Somos una zona donde hay altísimos niveles de pobreza, desigualdad y violencia. Y esto, pues por supuesto, se manifiesta en los asentamientos informales de la región. En el caso particular de Costa Rica, tenemos un poco menos del 10% de la población viviendo en, en asentamientos informales y este, dichos asentamientos se caracterizan por una serie de condiciones, entre esas pues la ausencia de información científica en muchos casos de manera oportuna y eficaz para poder conocer cuáles son las implicaciones verdaderas frente a toda la gran circulación masiva de fake news que, que vivimos a nivel social y que muchas veces en las comunidades se ven, digamos, incrementadas. A su vez, tenemos muchísimos problemas de acceso a agua potable, acceso a, a buen manejo de residuos, de acceso a condiciones sanitarias adecuadas, así como enormes cantidades de hacinamiento, de informalidad laboral. Esto es un aspecto importante porque la informalidad laboral conlleva que en los asentamientos no solamente las personas no puedan quedarse en casa porque necesitan generar ingresos todos los días para poder en muchos casos alimentarse, sino que también conlleva desplazamiento, sobre todo a la ciudad. Y eso significa que tenemos un reto este, grande en poder, digamos, asegurar que las condiciones en las cuales se desplazan, digamos, también sean las más idóneas a través de sistemas de transporte público que cumplan con ciertos protocolos. Y eh, un aspecto importante en el caso de Costa Rica es que también tenemos enormes niveles de violencia intrafamiliar y violencia contra las mujeres. Es, es lamentable, pero es, es, la rea, es la realidad. Y pues eh, además tenemos contextos culturales muy diversos, ¿verdad? Tenemos población... Eh, digamos, migrante, población refugiada, tanto del norte de nuestra frontera como del sur de nuestra frontera. Y pues en, en esos contextos culturales, eh, digamos que hemos encontrado, a pesar de todas estas problemáticas, podría decir es un entorno favorable de trabajo en asentamientos informales. Y la razón por la cual eso ha sido así desde la escala nacional es porque hemos planteado un protocolo para trabajar desde lo local. Es decir, la propuesta del gobierno nacional de Costa Rica ha sido que el protagonista en la en la dirección de las estrategias este, en cuanto a asentamientos informales y gestión territorial sean los gobiernos locales y pues para eso construimos un protocolo que contiene una serie de lineamientos técnicos con la finalidad de poder orientar a los gobiernos locales. 
Los gobiernos locales, igual que el gobierno nacional, están muy condicionados por las capacidades de su territorio y, y las capacidades socioeconómicas que las instituciones públicas, privadas, académicas y demás tengan en el territorio. Por ende, pues obviamente parto de la experiencia de Costa Rica, donde existen ciertas capacidades dadas a nivel nacional y por supuesto hay desigualdades y asimetrías a lo interno del país para poder hacer este, a poder trabajar desde lo local, entonces algo que hemos sido muy respetuosos es de considerar las diferentes condiciones, priorizar los municipios que son más vulnerables y poder, digamos, mantenernos más cerca de las zonas donde sabemos que tenemos mayor cantidad de este, asentamientos informales para poder priorizar el trabajo. Entonces, este protocolo tiene dos grandes líneas, de, si puedes devolverte un segundo nada más, por favor. Eh, Tres aspectos que son cruciales en este momento. El primero nos parece que fue, digamos, muy importante el poder definir que no se podían hacer desalojos eh, y por el contrario, más bien que era importante impulsar obra pública y comunitaria. Es decir, el, la situación económica eh, que enfrenta el mundo, en este caso Costa Rica, digamos, que ya tenía un déficit fiscal importante, eh, conlleva una necesidad de que el proceso, digamos, de, de atender la la pandemia sea compatible también con ir haciendo prospectivas sobre medidas que impulsen el empleo. En este caso, ha sido muy importante, lejos de desestimular el empleo y generar más pobreza a partir de los desalojos, pues, estimular el proceso más bien de creación de empleo en las comunidades y en las cercanías de las comunidades para poder lograr generación de ingresos, generación de autonomía y sobre eso, pues, capacidades para poder enfrentar la problemática actual. Segundo, dado que los recursos son escasos, eh, es importante saber a dónde poner esos recursos y por eso la información geostadística es, es crítica, ¿verdad? De esta manera vamos a poder obtener información clave que nos permita orientar a dónde, este, a dónde hacer nuestras acciones y también a dónde podríamos trabajar con mayor eficacia. Y en el caso nuestro, pues tanto el trabajo con las comunidades como el trabajo a nivel de, de análisis de datos han identificado que las principales necesidades en nuestro país, al menos, tienen que ver con el tema de los servicios públicos, con la garantía de poder brindar acceso a conectividad, porque es a través de la conectividad que también las personas pueden vincularse a los sistemas oficiales de información eh, sanitaria, sobre todo. Luego, aspectos de energía y agua, por razones obvias, ¿verdad? Entonces, estos han sido los principales aspectos, eh, dado que aspectos como la alimentación están en, media, en gran medida cubiertas por instituciones o bien por el sistema educativo que tiene comedores escolares a edad infantil y, y adolescente, y, este, y por programas públicos y alianzas público-privadas que se han generado para aspectos como alimentación. Entonces, eh, no es que está totalmente cubierto, no les puedo decir que está perfecto, digamos, pero hay, hay bastantes esfuerzos institucionales ya caminando en ese sentido. Entonces, resguardada la vivienda, resguardada la alimentación, lo siguiente, digamos, pareciera ser el empleo para poder generar ingresos y mantener autonomía. Por estas, digamos, este, tres grandes líneas de trabajo, algunas lecciones que nos parecen importantes rescatar. En el caso de Costa Rica pasa que tenemos unas leyes de salud muy estrictas, lo cual ha sido pues, positivo en el largo plazo para el país desde hace muchos años. Sin embargo, eso de alguna manera ha dejado la informalidad en una situación en la que no se trabaja. Por ende, una oportunidad para el gobierno nacional en este tiempo ha sido el, el generar respeto y aprendizaje sobre la informalidad. ¿En qué sentido? Pues en, la, en, en los asentamientos informales se resuelve la mayor cantidad de problemas de una manera muy dinámica, a bajo costo, y eso es algo de lo que el gobierno nacional y en general este, el país debe aprender. Este, y también aprender que no todo puede resolverse de la informalidad a la total formalidad, sino que eso es un proceso progresivo. Para muchos de ustedes esto suena muy obvio, pero en el caso de Costa Rica ha sido eh, una lucha, más bien que todavía estamos dando de entender que las soluciones a la informalidad deben ser progresivas. Eh, por último, otras lecciones importantes que hemos podido este, encontrar también en este proceso ha sido la necesidad de visualizar al sector de la construcción como un dinamizador social económico, al poder ser empleador de mano de obra no calificada y de empleo informal, hemos visto, digamos, que cumple, digamos, en, en el corto plazo, que es una urgencia que tenemos desde lo local y nacional, cómo muy rápidamente podemos lograr impactar poblaciones en situación de pobreza a través del empleo y generar a su vez, pues, productividad nacional. Eh, hemos visto en la construcción un aliado importante en ese sentido, eh, para poder orientar las inversiones, y es crucial poder tener datos, pero la evidencia no viene solamente de los datos, sino también de las personas y de los líderes comunitarios. Entonces, el planteamiento que hemos hecho en Costa Rica parte de los gobiernos locales. ¿Por qué? Porque son los gobiernos locales los responsables de articular con los principales protagonistas de estos procesos, que son las comunidades a partir de sus liderazgos comunitarios. Acá hay retos importantes porque sabemos muchas veces hay relaciones político clientelares este, desde lo local con lo 
con lo comunitario, lo digo por mi propia experiencia, entonces ahí es justamente donde los datos geoestadísticos se vuelven muy importantes para que eh, la oportunidad de trabajo con, con comunidades eh, esté revestida de objetividad y de, y de información científica. Y por último, pues tal vez más, eh, más como reflexión personal sobre el rol de los alcaldes, que en el caso de Costa Rica es muy importante porque son quienes lideran los procesos de emergencia, es el rol de la gerencia social de las alcaldías. Es decir, este es un momento en el cual las destrezas en cuanto a no solo conocimientos técnicos, sino habilidades blandas, capacidad de negociación, resolver crisis, este, actuar rápidamente, se vuelven cruciales. Entonces, yo creo que este es un momento también, eh, o aprovechar este espacio para decir, es importante que a veces detengamos la bola, pongamos, como decimos en Costa Rica, luces largas, es decir, a, a pesar de que estamos en una operación muy rápida, veamos el largo plazo y podamos tener consejos asesores que de alguna manera orienten a los gobiernos locales líneas estratégicas de trabajo que son importantes con las comunidades a nivel de inversión con el gobierno nacional y pues eh, que podamos eh, que podamos de esta manera poder orientar acciones rápidas, que tengan alto impacto, que sean conocidas por las personas y valoradas también, que esto en este contexto es muy importante, lo que en este momento lo que no se ve no existe y, y eso genera desesperanza en un momento que es crítico, mantener el sentido de unidad. Así pues que de parte de Costa Rica este protocolo está online, cualquier duda que pueda existir al, al respecto con mucho gusto. Eh, agradecerles a los organizadores por la invitación y quedamos por acá a la orden. Muchas gracias, Patricio. Uh, thank you for reminding us about the impacts on COVID, on domestic violence and on the vulnerability of migrants and refugees. Uh, very important key messages on the process from Costa Rica and about the key importance of ed evidences from data and people and community leader and the need for social support. Thank you. I will call now to the floor uh, the mayor of Freetown, Yvonne Aki Sawyer. Uh, Freetown um, was also a pioneer, pioneer, I believe, in designing a strategy uh, to respond to COVID and beyond, no? with a large trajectory fighting and surviving health crisis. <laughs> Mayor, are you online? Over to you. Hi, Thank you very much. Thank you for the platform. Um, I'm looking to see, hi, Emilia, I'm looking to see if the slides are going to come up. Um, okay, so thank you all. Um, as, as was mentioned just now, we, um, we're actually at the very start of the outbreak. We were fortunate to have a little bit of time um, to get ourselves prepared because our first case wasn't um, uh, confirmed until the 31st of March. But we had begun working in February and we had published a city plan um, on the 20th of March. Um, in terms of informality, Freetown, like most of your cities, um, has various levels of informality. Uh, the three key ones being the informal settlements, um, informal transport, um, and informal employment. And in, from the perspective of all of these, it makes the key preventative measures of COVID very difficult. We only have 47% of our population in these informal settlements and citywide with access to running water. If, if your main mode of transport is an Okada, a motorbike, where you're holding the person in front of you, the driver, social distancing is a myth. Um, so we, our plan has been around how do we address those and I'm happy, it's on our website, but obviously happy to share it into this forum for easier dissemination. So the COVID plan that we designed aligning with natural gov national government, although this has been, you know, uh, um, the point that Emilia made, this has really been a point of some coordination challenge, shall I say, um, in, in, in terms of us having a plan but really being starved of information and starved of resources. Um, with, again, with regards to the informal settlements, uh, the, the, the approach that we've taken has been threefold. There are three strategic elements to our plan. Number one, behavior change messaging, the front line of the, of the response, making sure we get the message out. And this is really building from the lessons we learned from Ebola, of which there were four, command and control, clear reporting lines, clear management structures, clear information flows. Now, that was the first. The second one, community ownership, at the heart of our response plan, um, making sure the community owned this, whether they're in formal settlements or not. Third, closing the gap, 
between reality and protocol, protocol and practice, and fourth, isolate, track, and contain the virus. So our plan is challenged. It has three elements. So those were the lessons, the context from Ebola. The plan itself has three elements very quickly. Behavior change messaging, speaking to the people in a manner which they understand. So community ownership is key. We've set up um, community ownership, out, community outreach teams, which move across the city in every ward. But then that's going at a horizontal. Then at a vertical, we have sector and special interest specific community groups. So persons with disability, Ebola survivors, the Slum Dwellers Association, the Commercial Drivers Unions, the Interreligious Community Council. So we work with them to target their special interest groups whilst working across the city with the councillors to reach every community. But the challenge comes also from the lack of devolution of urban planning um, and access to land when it comes to simple things like social distancing and wanting to be able to spread out. But in all that we're doing in our plan, of which the first is behavior change messaging, the second is behavior change support. If I tell you wash your hands and you have no water, how do you do that? So we're investing a lot on providing water supply into our communities, but building resilience. So not just bringing tanks and bowsers, but also using this opportunity to put in place rainwater harvesting systems. How oh, this have, you know, streams, how can existing streams be treated um, so it can be a sustainable solution? We're working with providing community kitchens, the lockdowns the government sets up, but we're also introducing urban farms into our slum communities so that we have those, that resilience being built. Um, and lastly, if we look at learning from the crisis, I think a message that's coming across to everyone, existing vulnerabilities are heightened by the crisis. If you didn't have water before the crisis, you know now how important it was to have water. If your communities, and we have long-term plans, medium-term plans already for slum upgrades, for informal settlements, upgrades um, and relocations, but they become a greater priority. So a key lesson would be investing in the future before you need to. Gender mainstreaming is part of how we're doing the response, but it's also part of our invent interventions. The community outreach teams I described have to be 50% women, but we also have interventions such as supporting um, the women's center because we know there'll be an increase in gender-based violence. So we're actually putting money aside to ensure that they can cope um, whilst making sure our messaging speaks to these issues. And finally, I would say in terms of um, uh, uh, um, this outbreak and how we're looking at things, there's no option but to take risks. Um, we are financially constrained, but we need to make big decisions um, such as waiving the issuing of, of um, property rate notices to our least, uh, the, the least economically uh, strong to our most vulnerable and doing it in such a way that we hope will not result in other other members of society saying, well, if they're not paying, we're not paying. So it's a question of taking risks. But um, we, we are early. We have today 104 cases. Um, and we know that the numbers will increase, particularly in our informal settlements. But we, we've got our plan ready. At the heart of success is community ownership and them actually stopping the transmission. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, uh, for highlighting also the importance of gender mainstreaming in taking decisions. Uh, I would now go to Asia, to the Mayor of Subanjaya, uh, Noraini Roslan, also to share the comprehensive strategy of responding to COVID and integrating informal uh, labor and settlements. Hello. Hello. Good night from Subanjaya, Malaysia. Good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, thank God we are all alive and well and can join the live learning experience today. Um, COVID-19 pandemic situation in Malaysia has impacted our, the whole of 32 million population. Even though our ranking is not as bad as some other countries, but uh, already 5,851 people have been uh, infected and we reached 100 deaths today. 
And for Subang Jaya City uh, alone, we have 85 uh, positive cases and one death, which is not as bad. But um, since we are close to the capital city and other cities that are highly affected by COVID-19, our areas has been uh, zoned as red district. So uh, students or people from outside the district cannot go into our district. Um, nationwide, uh, the trending is going towards the recovery phase, uh, but we still have 94 new cases today. And um, there has been a worry of uh, relapsed cases like Singapore and Hong Kong. So we are trying to test um, more and more people. And so far, about 150,000 people have been tested. Uh, at the local level, uh, our city council have to continue with the, um, the, the, the functions that we are normally doing. Uh, but in addition to that, during the uh, movement control order that has been invoked in Malaysia since 18th of March, we have the added responsibility of monitoring public places and ensuring essential services are um, being conducted safely by regulating operating hours and keeping safe distance. Uh, we have to continue with the cleaning services, with uh, disinfecting the public places and ensuring the operators that are operating disinfect their premises. And on top of that, we are also helping with the distribution of food. And uh, we have to go to the low-cost houses that cannot do the disinfection themselves. Um, so we are doing this with the fire departments and um, our own health departments. Um, with regard to the informal sector, there has been some reluctance by other cities and the state government to recognize the home-based business. Uh, we have been shutting down all uh, stall and um, small food uh, traders and operators, and they have not been having much income during the movement uh, control order. So the federal government have been um, offering about 250 billion ringgit uh, Malaysia economic stimulus of which um, there are various um, grants that is given to the small and medium um, scale industries, specifically for micro businesses uh, 2.1 billion will be distributed to 700,000 uh, business people um, in a form of special grant. There has also been moratorium on loan repayments and income subsidy to low income groups. At the state level, they are, they are also doing the same thing, um, totaling to 420 million ringgit Malaysia and 40 million will be for small uh, business people and traders alone. So how do we get this to the affected um, business people? Because uh, in my city, there is not many informal housing left because we have done with um, um, resettling the squatters to formal housing back in 2005. I believe there's only less than 5% uh, of the people living in rented houses, uh, which are uh, comprised of people migrating from other countries and other cities. And we have about uh, 200 people uh, from Rohingya uh, under the UNHCR program. So how do we take care of these people? Um, but food donation has been a popular activity since the movement control order by um, the government organization, the NGOs, but uh, since we do not want people to gather um, and, and creating new crowds and, and uh, failing in social distancing, so this has been asked to be, uh, the donation has been asked to be given through the uh, welfare departments and the local authorities. Uh, but um, I, I see the new culture of the rich trying to help the poor by positioning themselves in um, this uh, food distributions and helping the, the poor. I mean, I, they, they must be either doing it uh, altruistically or some companies want to do it for publicity, but uh, we welcome all of those. Um, other than the food distribution, there are disinfecting services that I've told you uh, in the low cost houses. Um, 
one problem that has occurred during this Ramadan month when we observe fasting, normally there are small traders uh, selling foods for the breaking of fast. And since the movement control order is invoked, these people cannot earn their income through these activities. And my city has been um, registering all these informal sectors and the new uh, riders or e-hailers that have not been registered within a company before. They become an individual who, who conducts home-based business. Um, I have had difficulties convincing the state to recognize these people, but I do believe that we need to acknowledge these businesses because it's the only way that they can earn their living during this uh, movement control order. Um, um, yeah. And, and without recognizing them, without um, registering them, that means we are leaving them to operate um, without any regulation or monitoring. Whereas the law indicates that we have to um, regulate all food handlers. So this is a new challenge for us. And there have been many portals that are, um, created this new uh, marketplace for these people to do to conduct business. And so far, um, some cities in Malaysia have been acknowledging this uh, new marketplace, these portals that that provide platforms for home owners, uh, home business owners, and um, new online businesses to have a site that um, people can easily search for them. Um, those are for businesses. Um, moving towards housing and shelter security, the government has uh, allowed for loan moratoriums extending up from three months to six months so that this, um, the money that used to be paid for loans can be saved for other uh, emergency purposes, for savings and, and to cover the loss of income. Uh, and for government housings, like the one that we have in Subang Jaya, we have to um, allow for rent free for the next three months. And um, most uh, government owned premises have been given rent free also uh, for during the movement control order and also for at least the next three months. Um, getting back to how we can help uh, this informal sector through acknowledging them and if we have a new site to move them to the new site where they can have their business near to their houses because some of them has transportation problem if we move the new sites to a place far away from their houses they will have problem of uh, mobility um, so it is quite a challenge to find a suitable place to relocate these um, businesses because they prefer to uh, set up their stalls um, near the junctions at where the government um, lands are. But um, whether we like it or not, these um, sectors have to be acknowledged, have to be registered, and um, it needs to be legalized in a friendly manner. Um, because um, we can't just um, ignore this uh, sector and um, what more enforcing them during this difficult uh, period. So we are creating new guidelines, first for the home-based business that um, before this, we don't have a, a way of regulating online business. We have to do that. Secondly, we have to empower and facilitate um, instead of uprooting and ignoring or abolishing these businesses. This can only be done by engaging with uh, these uh, business people on the ground itself. Um, as far as Asia Pacific is concerned, we are also uh, designing a web uh, to traditionally uh, digitize uh, this uh, traditional market. So efforts are being done both at the local level and at the Asia Pacific level. Well, that's as much as I can share for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Wonderful. I specifically liked the legalize in a friendly manner. But as you spoke about grassroots, I will move to Jane Viru, representing grassroots movement from uh, Kenya, uh, also a legal expert, Jane, my old friend, also a legal expert behind the design of the special planning areas. No? This can be uh, a very important tool 
uh, for mayors and cities around the world to implement infrastructure in slums. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane. Thank you very, very much. I think when the COVID-19 pandemic was declared, all of us in Nairobi held our breath because we were petrified. We were petrified because we knew the guilt that we have lived with for so many years. The guilt of having 50% of our city living in untenable conditions, where we have over 200 people occupying one acre of land, living in a 10 by 10 squat, without running water, without toilets. And that is our reality. And that what put the fear of God in us. And we said, God forbid that this pandemic, this virus should land in the slums of our city. I think God had our prayers and thank God we have had very few cases of the COVID-19 in our informal settlements. And so I pray that this gives us an opportunity to change our ways. And I believe that we will. I believe strongly that the COVID-19 pandemic is a new beginning for the city of Nairobi. And why do I say this? I say this because about two years ago, we worked with the city government of Nairobi and they declared one of the largest, I think it must be the largest in former settlement in Nairobi that sits on about 670 acres of land and houses about 100,000 families as a special planning area. On the declaration of Mukuru, because it's called, the area is called Mukuru, as a special planning area, the county government was required by law to prepare special plans. Plans that would respond to the unique development problems and opportunities of this area. So it was required to do this within, this, within two years. And I'm happy to say that today, uh, through collaboration between the city, universities, the private sector, and NGOs, we have sector and special plans for Mukuru for the provision of water, for the provision of sanitation at the plot level. Because I, I think I did mention that this whole area with 100,000 households has only 3,000 pit latrines. So this plan makes provision for the, for, the, for the reticulation of water and sanitation services to the plot level. So just um, after the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, we got a call from the new metropolitan government that is now in charge of Nairobi. <laughs> if you're not a Kenyan, I don't think, I don't think you'll understand this. And they said to us, where are the plans that we have been developing? We want to implement them because we are very much aware that even if we were willing to have an ambulance service go into an, the informal settlements of Nairobi, there are no roads. There are no roads that can uh, allow for an ambulance to enter and leave. So where are these plans so that we can begin to implement them? And so we provided them with the plans and they have made a commitment to the people of Mukuru that they're going to implement these plans in full. They have also made a commitment to the other informal settlements within the city that they will declare all of them as special planning areas within these coming years. So what, what do I say? I say that resilience does not happen in a day. Resilience is, is a process. If we want communities to take part, in, in, in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and other pandemics that will come in the future. We must invest beforehand. We must invest in community and we must invest in planning and preparing, like Billy said, the budgets that are, that are recognized by local governments and that are implemented with the people. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Very pragmatic uh, and also insightful. Uh, so I will go to the to our respondent Steve Weir, Weir from Habitat for Humanity. Uh, Steve, uh, many spoke about the new normal 
So we expect that in the long, not so long term, all citizens, hopefully medium term, all citizens will have access to water, adequate housing, infrastructure, etc. How can we make sense of all these experiences shared by the panelists in paving the way towards this long term vision? Thank you, Anna Claudia. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Um, I was pleased to see that the topics that came up landed in the same buckets of our conversation that we had in Durban around the infor informal settlement, informal economy, the papers that we wrote together. I think there's a lot of hope for having a common agenda as we move forward. What I thought was really interesting is we started our conversation in Durban talking about changing the narrative. And I think what's different in this conversation is maybe a call for a bigger narrative. And so there is now uh, where we saw informal settlements and formal housing and formal infrastructure as being precarious. Actually, now all of that is precarious for all of us, uh, especially when you think about what we heard today, how many people in the informal sector um, there are who have businesses, but how many people who live in informal settlements actually drive the infrastructure of the formal sector in the city? Uh, I know that in many cities in the U.S., 25% of the population is still at work, even though we are supposed to be sheltering in place. Well, much of that 25% are not doctors and nurses. They're people of very low income wages who drive the infrastructure, and that's true globally. Um, one of the respondent, one of the people talked. One of the respondents talked about settlements, economy, and transport being three main issues, and those were certainly true in our paper, and I think are highlighted in in this time of COVID. So I would say that so one would be this idea of precariousness is both heightened, but actually now we see that the precariousness of low income households and families drives a more precarious city. So that, that's part of the bigger narrative. Human rights was the second thing that I think we talked a lot about over time. And what I really liked about this conversation is talking about human rights at, from a pragmatic approach, from inclusive communities, equitable cities. And it's not surprising because mayors are, we talk about them being the first line responders. Uh, one of the respondents talked about investing in the future so we need to have COVID responses that invest in the future. Well, that's more than a human rights approach. That's a pragmatic approach. And I think those are the kind of approaches that, uh, were, that we were described today. The third one I would say is this idea of the local government units being the first responders. And we always say that, and that's true. It's not the national government's local responders. But I think what came out clearly in the presentations today, if the local government users local government units are the first responders, the organized local community grassroots communities are the hands and feet of those first responders. And it's important for us to realize that in times of COVID, I think what we see is we talk about uh, informal settlements and economies being invisible, clearly with the lack of infrastructure uh, for the formal economy, uh, we can see that their outputs are not invisible. So that's, I think, been heightened. I love the making your cities work conversations. I love the self-organizing conversations that uh, Jane and others talked about. The, the need for data and mapping is being critical. It's critical for a bigger narrative, but also critical for making uh, science-based, evidence-based solutions. Those were across all of them. Um, I would just point out a couple of things before I close. One would be, I like the, we talk about policy coherence. Some, several of responders talked about protocol coherence. So it's not enough to have policy. Pragmatically, we have to have the national government, the city government, the communities actually aligned in the way that we respond to a disaster. And this is a disaster. I like the notion of shared accountability, national to city, but I would say if we were going to include informal settlements, there's a shared accountability national to cities to the informal settlements. They really should be part of the conversation. Um, and I guess I would just close in saying, sometimes at Habitat for Humanity, we talk about the importance of P4, people, public, private partnership. We often talk about those private partnership, people, public, private partnerships being a project 
But I think what we're seeing now is it's really the way our city should work every day in every way. If we have, or we, if we're to have the horizontal collab collaboration that we talked about in the paper and in Durban, and that came up in several of the conversations, uh, it, that horizontal collaboration rests on full collaboration by all of the people in the city. I like the notion of that collaboration driving inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable cities that we all search for. And, and I would say that we should uh, not waste a crisis, as people say. Let's see this crisis as an opportunity, not just to change a narrative, but create a bigger narrative about how informal settlements and uh, informal economies don't just drive those with low incomes, but they actually drive the formal and support the formal sector uh, to, to create these resilient cities that we, that we hope for. So those are some of the main themes that I saw and it was really a great conversation. Thank you, Steve. Full in agreement that we need to be pragmatic to fulfill human rights, the rights of the city. So with that, I think our panel is concluded. Uh, come you to you, Emilia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Claudia, and congratulations uh, with, uh, with that very significant uh, panel that, that, uh, that you have been able to, uh, to facilitate within more or less the time that, that we had available. It's always very hard to cut those stories short because they are very significant, they are important, and they, um, they allow us to learn a lot. Um, and I think uh, one of the last points that, um, that um, Stephen has made is, is one, is how I would like to start with the next panel, also with, with many mayors and, and, and partners. And that is this notion that uh, public-private uh, people partnerships are no longer a project. They, they cannot be an experiment. It's part of the co-creation that we need. And both in the global north and global south, we have seen that in a pandemic such as this, we need everybody to be on board for measures to work. Um, and there is no single sphere of government that can, that can face these challenges. And we've been saying this very same sentence when we were negotiating the 2030 agenda and when we were providing inputs uh, for that. And from our perspective as constituency of local and regional governments, the 2030 agenda remains a very valid framework to work in the post-COVID era. I think my team has been sharing with you the UCLG Decalogue, the 10 measures that we think we need to work around uh, in, in, in the future. I invite you to have a look at that. It's an open process, open until the end of May, and we will be very happy to, to include your visions under each of those headings that, that we have identified.